Hey, welcome to the Vibe Church Podcast. I am so glad that you found us. I trust that what God brings into your life today through this word is going to bless you, expand you, and grow you as a result. I pray that God equips you. I pray that God mobilizes you after hearing this word. Enjoy. Well, we're going to kick off a brand new series today called Main Character. We're going to begin a journey. And it's a journey that we're going to take this month together. And we're going to begin today. And I want to start us off in a chapter of Romans chapter 12. So would you just grab your Bible out real quick? Stay standing with me. We're going to read the Word of God together. And I want to go to Romans chapter 12. I want to take a little moment and I actually want to just share the whole chapter in its entirety with you. And that's why I want you to have your Bible so you can read along with me because this is going to frame where we're going to go this entire series. And trust me, while this is a strong chapter in the Word of God, it is a rich text that should fill your heart with a polarity and a perspective of the Christian. And it says this in Romans chapter 12, verse. let's go from verse 1. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we though many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in in, in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation or the one who contributes in generosity the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honour. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be consistent in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but... Give thought to do what is honourable in the sight of all. If possible, so as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, verse 21, be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. (sighs) That is, that's straight Bible. That's, That's some good eating right there. Over this series, we're gonna unpack this chapter in its entirety, but specifically today, I wanna extract and disseminate one verse in particular, which is gonna be verse three. And it's gonna kind of be the, direction of our conversation as we kick off this journey. And I want to start this series by talking to you from the subject, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? You ready for the Word of God? All right, with the brotherly affection that the Apostle Paul directs us, would you greet somebody next to you and say, thank you for sitting next to me? Would you do that? Show them some brotherly affection, some genuine love, and the worship teams all over the world, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Go ahead and take your seat. I hope you're happy with who you're sitting next to. It's too late to change. (laughs) So what we have with Romans 12 specifically is a, a transitional point in this epistle. 
It's essentially a shift from the Apostle Paul's theological teaching that he spends the first 11 chapters doing to now what we're going to find a section of practical application. Romans 12 is highly regarded as the pinnacle of Romans where after that 11 chapters of doctrinal teaching on Christ, where he unpacks his mercy towards sinners and how we come to God through Christ. So now we find, as you begin to read and continue to read, a series of exhortations on, on really the practical duty of Christians. He, he, he begins to exhort us on our obligations to God and he frames it in view of all that God has done, how we can live for Him, how we can respond to Him in a way that will truly be pleasing to Him. And what you'll find within this chapter, chapter 12 particularly, is simply an outline for breaking out of the world's mold. An outline for how we break out of the mold that the world wants to conform you to. Now, when I say the word breaking out, it's not a cute word. It's not like a a breakout artist or a breakout album, like this is your moment to shine. That is not what I am referring to. Neither is the Apostle Paul. It is not a mild breakout. This is not a moment for you to be noticed. This is a jolting, a waking up from a slumber that you've been under, a conditioning that you've been formed to most of your life. But now the Apostle is saying, wake up. That's the severity. I'm sorry for those that were drifting off to sleep. I, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> But that's the severity with which the Apostle Paul is so abrupt what he's saying. Did you hear what he was saying? It's contrary to the world. It's so contrary to the way the world thinks and the way the world acts. It it almost feels offensive to read it. That when you're reading it and you're hearing it and you're like, are you for real? You want me to love those who hate me? You want me to repay evil with good? But, But that's the mold that the world puts on you. Repay evil with evil. If someone wrongs you, wrong them. But but what the apostle is trying to do is trying to jolt you and get you up out of that particular mindset, out of that mindset of control and conditioning. In fact, I really do have to ask as we begin this series, I do wanna know, are you even aware that the world is trying to conform you? It ain't a passive thing, it's an active thing that the world is constantly trying to, I'm talking about this worldly culture and its allure. It's constantly working on you to bait you and to consume you or or better still draw you into its way of thinking. And while you might be somewhat aware, it might not be exactly how you think. Uh, If you grew up in church like me, anybody grow up in the church, like you're a church kid, like from as long as you can, yeah, look at the church kids. Be proud about it. Don't be shy. Don't, it's not like, it's not like you're a part of Boy Scouts or something. Come on, you grew up in the church. You grew up in the church. Yeah, I grew up in the church too. So for all of y'all, like me, that grew up in the church, when we talked about worldly culture, it was talking about parties. <laughs> it was talking about, you know, drugs. It was talking about uh, definitely sex outside of marriage and fornication. That's the worldly culture that we would have re- reference to. Now, of course, that is worldly behaviours and worldly culture. But, but, but more than that, what the Apostle is referring to when he talks about the worldly culture is a conforming to, to, to a worldly culture that is way more subtle and deceptive than you actually think. You see, the pattern of this world actually has more to do with the lies and the deception that we tell ourselves. For example, have you ever, have you ever met anybody with that main character energy? Anybody know what I'm talking about? That just, that's that, it's this, believe it or not, main character energy is actually a diagnosable psychological disorder known as main character syndrome. Do your own research. I have. You just thought it was your cousin. No. It's a, it's a, it's a diagnosable psychological disorder called main character syndrome. Now, I know all of y'all are thinking about that one person that you know. But just for a moment, let's put the lens on our own life for a moment. Because what main 
character syndrome does. It represents a person who sees themselves as the main character in every situation and tends to present a false or exaggerated version of themselves as if a camera is on you at all times. Like a modern day influencer or vlogger, everywhere you go, it's like you have to present this person. It's a persona that we push, a, a person that we present. We switch it on, we fall back into the real us, but when the moment's on and people are watching, we like to present this particular persona. Those people, they tend to romanticize and dramatize situations, portraying themselves as a victim while everyone else is the villain. Now, while we definitely like to identify these people and while it might be a viral trend on social media today, I'm gonna tell you it's not a new phenomenon. You see, main character syndrome is a perspective that, or a presentation that we bring devoid of reality. It's essentially a term that portrays the mindset of a narcissistic individual to, who views themselves as the main character in every single circumstance and setting that they find themselves in. Now, I don't know if you have ever met one of these folk. I don't know if you're drawing a blank on what could that look like and who could that be, but if you do want to view it, I would encourage you to simply go to a popular tourist destination. They're there. They are, they are there in force. Over the summer break, uh, we got to go with some of our friends, uh, Justin and Francesca, to the, the Vatican Museum. It was fun. It was great. It was hot as hell, though. I don't know if that was a, I don't know if there's anything symbolic, but it was reality. It was hot. Not only was it hot, there were like thousands of people squished together. And because it's Italy, there ain't no air conditioning. So you got Justin and I, we're literally trying to find any pedestal fan there was, any breeze. Like if there was a window, we were at the window, viewing the art from afar. Like they had these like security guards. Anybody been before, you know, there's these like security guards positioned throughout the place and they get a little fan. And so I didn't care, you could arrest me. I'm standing in front of this thing. I, need, I needed some reprieve. And so you got Justin and I huddled around the fan like it's a heater in winter. We're just there like getting cool. And, 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 and there's a tour going on and we had like the earpiece and we're, we're listening from as far as the range could allow us before we get out of distance. And, 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 and I noticed some things because as people are there, rightly so, they're taking photographs and videos of the incredible artwork and sculptures that are on display. I mean, you've got ancient art. You've got, you've got primitive art. You've got incredible Renaissance art that was made with primitive tools, but is so beautiful and tells a story and it's a timepiece of culture and the development of civilization. And just to be there in the midst of that, but despite the heat and the craziness and the crowds, you, you, it's hard to not get swept up in the moment. To just get immersed. I didn't even take a photo. I was just in the moment. I was present. I, I felt like just the, the, the weight of that moment, learning about the artists, what they were conveying, the sculptures and the stories, the leaders throughout generations that had led civilizations and empires. And it was overwhelming. Overwhelming to say the least. To, to not just look at the art, but the style in which they did the art. There's layers to this thing. There's so much going on. And yet what caught my attention was while there were some people taking photos of the artwork, there were others having photos taken of them looking at an artwork. No. <laughs> Somebody say main character. <laughs> like, like you're in there with all of this history, beauty, but you want that to be your backdrop. Yes. You, want, you want this statue that has so much significance, so much art, so much history, so much prominence, but yet that's gonna be a supporting character to your cast. This is one girl. She was dressed up. Like, I mean, it's hot. It's, it's like, I can't even describe how hot. It's stuffy and it's hot. But this, this girl is so dressed up, she strategically positioned herself next to a piece of art and yet she's getting frustrated that people are in her shot. Main character. Now, now I know that this is 
somewhat comical when we look at the main character on display like this, but I do have to say, while that's a harmless example of a main character mentality, it is a picture of a self-oriented society with which we live. I ain't going to do it. I'm not going to go into our culture and gender confusion and transgender men who want to play in women's sports. I ain't, I'm, don't push me. I ain't going to do it. I'm not going to say that it's really not a feeling or an ideology as much as it's a main character wanting to be in the spotlight, whatever the cost. I ain't going to say that. I'm not, I'm not going there. Don't push me. But you'll judge that and yet cheat on your taxes. As if somehow you are not under the law, you're above it. That's main character mentality. See, before you judge, be careful. I'm talking about character. I like this crowd. (laughs) You see, it's your actions will always result in your thinking. I I can do that way more poetically. I'll say your beliefs determine your behaviors. Your beliefs are what will determine your behaviors. This is why Paul presents a warning to not conform to the pattern of this world which promotes self above all else. If you wanna, if you wanna articulate the, the culture of the world, worldly culture, as much as wild parties, fornication, sex outside of marriage, all these things are worldly activities, there's one word, word that will ultimately define worldly culture which is self. Self. Self above all else. Needless to say, this obviously works in opposition to the Christian life that centers around humility, selflessness, Christ-likeness, or what could simply be summarized as character. 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 By the way, I forgot to mention, but I assume you already know because we've preached it before, that when it comes to the main character, while you're not the main character, Jesus is. Just in case there was any confusion just in case there was any, any backward thinking that Jesus is the main character. Some of you are looking at me like, if I'm not the main character, who is? My, my spouse? No, 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 not your spouse. It's Jesus. Jesus is the hero. Jesus is the Savior. If anything, if you want to locate yourself in Scripture, Scripture kind of more identifies us as the rescued bride, as the romantic interest, as the empowered soldier, or as the mighty men that are fighting with God. That, that we get to, it's kind of cute a little bit too because he goes, hey, you want to fight? Here's a weapon, but he already fought the battle and he won the victory. So we get to walk in victory, ho- victoriously holding a sword. That's, that's, that's how, it, how, it, how it goes. Now, the truth of the matter that while I hate to break your heart and say you're not the main character, you are meant to make character the main thing. That's a really good sentence, but (laughs) you see, character, believe it or not, is actually one of the main focuses of the apostolic writers throughout the epistles. What you're going to find is the apostles, it's like a theme that is hidden, but is actually very obvious when you begin to see it, that all of the apostles, when they're writing their epistles, one of the main themes is the Christian character. It's, it's, it's emphasizing and highlighting the empowerment of the person to actually be not just a holder message, but also be a messenger. The gospel, which is a good message, deserves a good messenger. Now, what you've got to understand the Bible will do is it will qualify you, even with your weaknesses, that, that you are like an earthen vessel with cracks. And how good is God to put His potent and powerful message even in an earthen vessel? But what God wants to do in the apostle, apostolic, writers want to do is they want to shape the church that we would take a good message called the good news and that we would hold good character so that the vessel and the messenger would not actually diminish the message but would enhance the message. That we would take the messenger because of our good character, the good news would hold its power. The the combination is actually critical to effectively being a doer, not just a hearer, of the word, James 1.22, for reference. For example, when writing to the Thessalonians, Paul puts it this way, saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, verse 
2, there we go. It says, we give thanks to God always. Check this out. For all your, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father, your work of faith and labour of love and the steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse four, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you because our gospel, our gospel, I like that, our gospel, not just the gospel, they don't disassociate themselves from the gospel, that they bring the gospel into now, not just a message, but their message also. That because of what Christ has done in my life, this good news applies to me, that our gospel came to you not only in word, that's the message, Not only was it a message, but also empowering the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Check this out. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. So there is a message that came in power. But what we proved as the messengers was that we are not just a good message, but we are good messengers. We, we were proved, our character was proved among you for your sake. So that you would not just hear the message, but dismiss it because the messenger. That you wouldn't just hear the message, but go, ah, oh, nah, they ain't living that. Nah, this can't be that good. Nah, that, nah, God. You know, there's, there's power in your testimony. So much power in your testimony. That when you share your story, of who I was before God met me. But the power of your testimony is not who I was, but who I am now. That's the power of your testimony. Who I was is a locating element because who I was is who you are. I'm identifying that I was there, but look at me now. I love this story in the, the Old Testament. You know the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Yeah, you know the story if you've been in, all those that grew up in, in church like me, where are you at again? Where are you at again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the rest of you, there's a story in the Old Testament about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Anyway, they get put in the fiery furnace, and it's an amazing story. I don't have time to go into all of it, but the, the details, the highlights are that as they're in the fire, they're not getting consumed. They're not getting burned up. In fact, they put three men in there, and they saw the image of four men. The fourth one looked like the son of man, and they're like, this is crazy. Pull them out. When they come out, out of the fire, they say this, not a hair was singed on their head, and not even the smell of smoke was on them. I love that sentence so much, because that is the testimony of a saint, that you had a crazy past. You were in the fire. You did go through the heat. But guess what? I can't even tell because God has redeemed you so far from that person. So now if you tell me that story, I'm shocked. I'm shook that no way. That should be someone's response when you tell your testimony. No way. Not, oh, it figures. Mm, yeah, I, I, can, I can tell. Like I, I, was, I was messed up, I was, I was a liar, I was a thief. Well, I could see that. No, that's, that should not. No, it, 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 because the message had effect. Because the message has gone to work and now the messenger has changed because of the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. This is what the apostles wanna make sure the church understands. It's not just talking about the message, but the importance of the character. Verse six, he says, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia. Paul is emphasizing the fact that the message had effect because the way we lived our lives became a model and example for you to live. And now you've taken one step further you're the model. You've become the example. He's complimenting the church that now you've become the example of what a redeemed life looks like. Now, if we go beyond the generic descriptions of character, we'll actually find that Christian character is essentially who we are as a result of our relationship with Christ. That, that's, that's what character is. Character is different from anointing. Character is different from gifting. It's different from calling. These are the things we love to preach about and hear sermons on, by the way. Pastor, tell me again about my calling. Pastor, tell me again how I'm gifted. Pastor, could you run it back on the anointing one? I just need a reminder that I'm anointed. We love to hear stories and sermons on that, but it's the very reason why gifted, anointed, and called leaders fail and fall morally. Because while they 
press down on their calling and they press down on their gifting and they double down on anointing. It was the character that was weak. You see, guess what? Check this out. God gives gifts. God does the calling. God gives the anointing. You develop the character. There's an old saying that says, your gifting will get you somewhere, but your character will keep you there. You're saying, Pastor, you want me to do some work? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. It's a partnership with God. God already does so much, but He says, hey, would you put to practice what I've written in my Word, the moral guideline that you would actually start to grow up in Christ. That your character is ultimately a description of who you are in Christ. It's what determines the strength of your moral makeup and and is the very measurement of excellence in a person. You see, how many people want to be excellent? I'm real worried about the people who don't put their hand up. (laughs) Nah. Pretty good with being average, actually. Come on, how many people want to be excellent? Like it's, it's literally the drive of human nature that we want to exceed. We want to excel. We, we want to be excellent in this life. If you haven't been watching the Olympics and not desiring to be excellent, I don't know what's wrong with you. You cannot be helped. But I mean, I want to be excellent. Well, the truth of the matter is, there is a way to be excellent. You see, what describes excellence, when you see what what describes the excellence of gold is its purity. What describes the excellence of an artwork is its beauty. Well, what describes the excellence of a Christian is their character. Character is the measure marker of excellence in your life. Your giftings don't measure your excellence. Your calling doesn't measure your excellence. It's your character that measures the amount of excellence that you present in this Life And the deeper your character, the more excellent you have become since the goal of the Christian life is conformity to Christ. And we know that Christ was the most excellent person to ever walk this earth. Are you still with me? I wonder what it would look like to just put in work on your character. Because you're busy putting work in on your gifting. But what would it look like to put in work on your character? Well, let me frame it with this question. Uh, What are you thinking? What are, you, what are you thinking? You see, I have to admit, I really, I really do appreciate the savagery of Paul here in Romans. Like, the, he has a tone and he has a style that as a pastor and a shepherd, I kind of like, I'll be honest with you. Particularly here in verse three where he's as, a, he's as subtle as a sledgehammer. He says, for, for by the grace of God given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Yep, it's on there too. Not to think more highly of himself or herself, put yourself in there, more highly than the ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now, right before that, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Okay, what's Paul doing here? Firstly, he is doing something for us important. He is locating where character comes from. Now, it's true that God enters your heart, but the way he works in your life is through your mind by changing the way you think. Paul is locating for the church exactly how Christian character is developed and where it's located. You see, the gospel that we're talking about, the good news of Jesus Christ is a call to unbelievers to repent of their sin and accept the free gift of salvation. That's the gospel message in one sentence. Repent of your sin and receive the gift of salvation. That is good news. It's good news because you have an opportunity to walk away from your death and destruction, which is a result of your sin, and turn away from that and turn to God, which is the free gift of salvation. Now, what you have to understand is that word repentance in Greek is the word metanoia. Metanoia means change of mind. That's repentance. Some of you think, well, repentance is, oh, I'm so sorry. Like repentance is an apology. I apologize for life of sin. I, I apologize for, 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 for thinking those thoughts and doing those things. I, I apologize. That's not repentance. Repentance is not an apology. It's a change of mind. 
It's, I'm changing my mind. I was living one way and thinking one way, but now because I'm repentant, I'm changing my mind and I'm aligning it with the thoughts of God. This is why the Apostle says to not think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That word highly is not just elevated, it's frequency as well. So it's not just thinking more highly because some of you have the problem of thinking too lowly. You, you go quiet on that one. You're, oh yeah, you're about the transgender stuff, but the lowly stuff, you gotta go quiet. Come on. So, some of you have... A problem with not elevating your thought, but self-deprecating yourself, constantly saying that I'm nobody, I'm nothing, I'm not worthy, no one will love me, no one would ever, come on. But it's not just about thinking about yourself too highly or too lowly, it's the frequency with which you think about yourself. Like a constant repeat at the forefront of your mind is you. Now I'm hitting the right zone. Now I'm like right on the target where the silence comes forth because we can't escape the thoughts of ourself. Thinking of ourselves in situation, thinking like everyone's talking about us, everyone's thinking about us. They must be thinking about us. When the bad situation, why is this happening to me? Like when the economy's down, God, why would you do this to me? Like, okay, <laughs> the whole economy was God's plan to get your attention. Okay. <laughs> okay, main character. In other words, what the apostle's trying to say in Romans 12 is, don't be thinking so much about you. (laughs) This is exactly what the world does. The world's constantly thinking about themselves, constantly preferring themselves. Thinking of yourself will not deepen your character. Okay, well, if we don't think about ourselves, what are we meant to think about? Well, Paul actually guides us in this as well. In a letter to now the Philippian church, if you go to Philippians chapter four, you're actually gonna find that like, a, like, like an accompanying passage to the letter to the Romans, he writes to the Philippians, not only to not think too highly of yourself, but what to think about. He says this in Philippians chapter four, verse eight. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable, if there is anything, if, if anything there is excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. Instead of thinking about yourselves, instead of thinking what others are thinking about you, control your thoughts. He says in another passage, take captive every thought. Hold it prisoner. The, the fact that you're thinking something, grab that thought. The th- fact that you're thinking about yourself, grab that thought, arrest that thought, make it a prisoner and begin to shift your thoughts to things that are excellent, things that are worthy of praise, things that are commendable and honourable, things that are an elevated thought. What a wild idea that you could be thinking about you too much. What a crazy idea. You don't become excellent by thinking you're excellent, but by thinking about excellent things. You don't become excellent by thinking you're excellent. You become excellent by thinking about excellent things. This is how you develop an excellent character, by taking you out of the focus lens of your life and putting what God calls worthy of your focus in the foreground of your life. Like that main character in the Vatican putting themselves in front of the masterpiece. Get yourself out of the way and begin to see the splendor of God. Can I show you another scripture that supports this? It's like just two chapters earlier in Philippians. He says in Philippians chapter two, verse three, don't be selfish. Thank you. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. There's this thinking again, thinking of others. If you have a problem and you're thinking of yourself, just start to think of others. And don't think of others as thinking about you because you're thinking about you. Just begin to think of others in a way that promotes others. He goes on to say, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same, check this out, attitude 
that Christ Jesus had. This is about to hit you real hard. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. He did not think. He didn't spend his time. Jesus, if there was anybody that had the right to think about themselves as excellent, it's Jesus. Like, but the Bible says that Jesus didn't spend his time thinking about him. He didn't spend his time when the disciples are acting crazy, be like, hey, yo, I am God. Like, can you show me some respect here? No, no, I'm sure there were moments of dissension. I'm sure there were moments of disruption, but Jesus in that moment didn't say, hey, hey, can we just get an angel in here just to remind them of who I am? Can we just like, you know, like they're just arguing amongst themselves and Jesus annoys them. Hey, can we just open up heaven, swallow one of them as an example of who I am? I am God in you. No, no, it doesn't say that. It says that Jesus, even being God, did not spend His time thinking about the fact that He is so important. He came humbled. He thought of others. How do I know He thought of others? Because He came to lay down His life for someone else. You never lay down your life while you're thinking about you. You only lay down your life when your whole thought is towards humanity and others. That's character. That's character. The most excellent man to ever walk the earth thought about excellent things. How do I know this? Because the Bible says in Isaiah 55, his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are higher than my ways. His elevated thoughts. His elevated thoughts. Some of you are gonna elevate your thoughts. Some of you are so busy focused on you in every single situation. You focus about what people are saying about you, what people are thinking about you. You're worried about your future. You're worried about your present. Get your thoughts on things that are excellent. Some of you have to now just come into agreement with God's thoughts over you. What a powerful tool that would be as the saint to get out of the world's culture and conditioning, which is trying to get you to think about you and start thinking about what God says over you. Come into agreement with that for a moment. I wonder what that would look like just to come into agreement with God, to give give God our amen. To say, God, you know what? I'm done thinking about me. God, I wanna think about what you say. I wanna think about what you've called me to. I wanna think about the kingdom of God. I wanna think about my neighbor, my church. I, I don't wanna think about me. When I think about me, I live stingy. I live crippled and feeble because I'm, I'm now thinking about my future. I'm thinking about providing for me and my safety. That's a feeble, crippled position. That's a worldly perspective, me and mine. I'm gonna protect me and mine. I'm gonna look after me. No, no, when I think about others, I'm thinking about the benefit of others. I'm thinking about the prosperity of the community. I'm thinking about being a contributor, not a critic. I'm not thinking about being someone who draws from the community. I'm thinking about someone being somebody who gives to the community because my actions flow from my thoughts. My behaviours flow from my beliefs. I know this is gonna sound real, real harsh, but if you don't like it, just pretend it's for your neighbour. But I know that you're thinking about you when you're not a participator or a generous person. When you take and you don't give, you're you're thinking about you. But when you're a giver, you're someone who understands that you've been freely given too. That's why I can freely give. This is why Jesus could so freely give His life. Because He wasn't thinking, this is character. Now we're going to go on a journey over this series of unpacking the depths of character, but we need to get ourselves out of the peripheral of our life for a moment. For us to even engage in an understanding of deepening our character, we need to get our eyes off us and get our eyes back on Jesus. 